Well, you've been in this series for several weeks now, and there are some uh, sermon notes if you want to uh, follow along. But before we get into that, our uh, Committee on Staff Parish Relations, you know, has been working diligently to uh, fill the, the different roles that uh, were left vacant after Nell uh, had to leave us. So we're happy to announce this morning that they've made a decision on a new youth minister. Okay? He begins March 1st. His name is Dylan Stanick. And uh, that is him with his wife, Kayla, uh, from their wedding a couple years ago. He's a young guy, about 23 years old. And uh, I stole a picture off his Facebook page as well, and that's probably a more current picture of him. Uh, but we really enjoy meeting with him. He's young. He really gets youth ministry, and uh, we're excited about him being here with us. Uh, he's also going to be helping us with some technology things and assisting in our contemporary worship service. He's had a lot of experience there. Uh, you will notice he has some things in his ears. We'll just, if it's the elephant in the room, he has some things in his ear. We talked a lot about those things in his ears, but that's who he is. And uh, he really is uh, a good young fella that we're looking forward to sharing in ministry with. You know, we don't refer to youth ministry so much anymore. The current term we use is student ministries. So we're going we're gonna to call him our director of student ministries and again, he begins March 1st, which is the Sunday after I get back from our trip to, uh, to Israel. Be praying for them. He's currently a youth director, children and youth ministry director at a Baptist church in Brandenburg, Kentucky. But he's been watching my series on being United Methodist, and he was able to, to, to snap off a few things about what it means to be United Methodist. Uh, let's look at uh, the scripture that Mary alluded to earlier. This is from Mark's Gospel, the 12th chapter, where it says, One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked them, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. You've truly said that God is one and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered him wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask Jesus any question. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jennifer and I married... 22 and a half years ago, we've had 18 wonderful years of marriage. <laughs> and to be perfectly honest, I was rather naive about the whole marriage thing. You know, Jennifer already had one marriage under her belt, and this was my first. So I first met Jennifer in Metropolis, but later moved to Centralia. So after the wedding, Jennifer moved into the home where I'd been living for a little more than a year. Now, I'll admit, in the early years of my ministry, when I was young and single and unfettered, my life pretty much consisted of working seven days a week. And in Centralia, I worked harder than I ever had, trying to please some church folks who could never be pleased. And that's what I did. In my naivete, I kind of assumed that after I got married, my life would pretty much resume its normal schedule of working seven days a week and giving my all to the church. Well, guess what? Don't try this at home. <laughs> Jennifer, meanwhile, found herself living in a new and strange place where she knew no one. She'd given up her own home in order to move into a house that I already considered my home, all beautifully decorated with my stuff. She'd left Metropolis, where she'd lived all her life, in order to marry some preacher who was going to have to move every few years. You know, and even worse, my young bride, who herself didn't grow up in church, was now seen as a preacher's wife. And honestly, I was completely oblivious 
to the pain and the grief and the loneliness that she was experiencing. But to her credit, she quickly pointed out my shortcomings. <laughs> we had some honest conversation, and as a result, I realized that I needed to make my wife a priority in my life. I had to realize that I wasn't married to the church, I was married to her. And one change we quickly made was that at least one night a week, we'd start going out on a date in order to spend some quality time together. We really needed to have some time apart from everything else in order to give undivided attention to one another. I think that lasted until the first kid came along. (laughs) But you know the rest of the story. We lived happily ever after. You know, it's one thing to fall in love, and it's something very different to stay in love, isn't it? Whether in marriage or any other relationship, staying in love requires time and commitment and trust. It requires talking and listening and spending time with one another with some occasional forgiveness thrown in. It requires patience and respect and persistence in order for that relationship to grow and mature and deepen. To stay in love requires some work and some effort, doesn't it? Truth be told, our relationship with God is no different. You know, a lot of us get excited and all warm and fuzzy when we first fall in love with God, when we first feel His amazing love deep within our hearts and our souls, but then we often fail to invest ourselves fully into that relationship. And what happens? We neglect spending time with God. We fail to communicate with God. As our lives get busier, God gets moved down on our list of priorities. And sometimes we even hide parts of ourselves from God that we'd rather not deal with. We don't fully share with God all of our heart and our soul and our passion. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at uh, the three general rules from our Methodist heritage, a part of our our doctrinal statements, which Bishop, Bishop Reuben Job has reframed as the three simple rules. What are they? Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Bishop Job says that these three simple rules have the power to change the world. And he further acknowledges that while the rules are simple and easily understood, that doesn't make them easy to practice. I'll remind you again that these three rules were at the heart of the Methodist movement as it began in 18th century England. They were the minimum expectation for participating in a weekly class with other Christians who were serious about growing in their faith and discipleship. So today we consider the third of these rules, which is stay in love with God. And when John Wesley drafted the three general rules, this third rule was originally expressed in this way. Attend upon all the ordinances of God. Now, if I walked up to any of you and said, attend upon all the ordinances of God, would you have any clue what I meant? According to Bishop Job, an ordinance is simply a practice that is ordained and given by God that helps us in keeping our relationship with God vital, alive, and growing. A practice given by God that helps keep our relationship with God vital, alive, and growing. And Bishop Job has reworded this third general rule in a very helpful way that you and I can appreciate and understand, making it quite simply, stay in love with God. In other words, do the things that help you stay in love with God. Invest yourself in your relationship with God. Give yourself fully to God and make God your number one priority in life. Now John Wesley, there he is, was very practical as well as very specific in instructing the early Methodists as to what practices were most important in keeping their relationship with God strong and alive and growing. They were the public worship of God. The ministry of the word, either read or expounded, the supper of the Lord, family and private prayer, searching the scriptures, fasting and abstinence. If we're going to have a quality relationship with God, if we're going to spend quality time with God, if we're going to maintain a healthy and vital relationship with God, these are some of the basic things we need to be doing as Christian disciples. So how do we stay in love with God? by worshiping with the gathered body of believers, as we're doing right now, 
the ministry of the Word through the teaching and preaching of Scripture, by celebrating and receiving the Lord's Supper frequently. I'm going to talk about that more upon my safe return from Egypt and Israel on March 1st, by praying privately and praying with family. How many of us still make it a priority to pray as a family? By searching the scriptures, spending time in the Bible, listening for God's voice, speaking into your life, and by fasting and abstinence. Fasting is a way of denying ourselves in order to pay attention to God and abstinence as a way of avoiding those habits or practices that harm us or interfere with our relationship with God. Wesley tells us that if you want to stay in love with God, these are some of the basic things you you need to be doing in order to keep your relationship with God healthy and alive. There's no question that the scriptures are very clear in telling us that loving God should be our main priority in life. As we've heard from Mark's gospel, when Jesus is questioned about the greatest or first commandment, he quotes the Hebrew scriptures and says that the first and greatest commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love God with your whole being, Jesus says. This should be your first priority in life. Make God number one. Again and again, the Psalms express a deep and intense longing for God. In Psalm 42, in a time of distress, the psalmist cries out, As the deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Have you ever longed for God like that? In another psalm, Psalm 116, the psalmist begins by declaring his love for God in this way. He says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. I love the Lord because he listens to me. In the New Testament, the letter to the Colossians instructs us to grow in our relationship with God by saying, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let me ask, how deeply is your life rooted in Jesus Christ? In the tiny book of Jude, which is the next to the last book in the New Testament, there's this wonderful verse. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God. How do we do that? By investing time and commitment in our relationship with God. By spending quality time with God in worship, in studying and searching the scriptures, in prayer alone or with others. By doing those things that create intimacy and familiarity and trust between ourselves and God. So my friends, let me ask you this. Are you in love with God? Are you in a committed long-term relationship with God or is it more like an occasional one-night stand? Is God your number one priority in life or do you fool around on God by giving your passion and loyalty, your time and commitment to persons or things or causes that really don't matter that much? If you really love God, what are you doing in your life to keep that love alive? What are you doing to stay in love with God? When my kids were much younger, I'd be the one who would take uh, Lauren and Carson to elementary school each morning, and as they got out of the car, I would say, have a good day, and remember, your father loves you. They've always thought I'm kind of nuts. But you know, as they faced the challenges and opportunities of each day at school, I wanted them to remember that there's someone who loves them and cherishes them no matter what happens throughout their day. And you know, my great passion in preaching and in ministry is to help each and every one of you know how much God loves you. You are precious to God. You're cherished by a God who loves you immeasurably and unconditionally. No matter what happens in life, 
no matter how bad you screw up, nothing will change the simple fact that you are loved and cherished by God. Now following that comes a very important question. Are you in love with the God who loves you so much? And if so, what are you doing about it? What time and attention are you giving God in your life? What are you doing to nurture and sustain your relationship with God? Are you keeping the love alive? In my first sermon this year, I mentioned that I make a monthly visit to a friend, a Benedictine monk who is my spiritual director, and we basically spend an hour each month talking about what's going on in my relationship with God and and just the condition of my spiritual life. And last fall, I complained to him that I was getting so busy that I felt like my spiritual life was kind of drying up. I was feeling really empty and and really kind of feeling disconnected from God. I was so busy every day that God was getting squeezed out of my schedule. In typical fashion, Father Noel had some very good advice. He said, tell your secretary that for the first 30 minutes of each day, you have an important appointment with someone. Tell her you want no interruptions during that time and put it on your calendar. I said, if I tell my secretary that I'm meeting with someone important and there I am sitting in my office by myself, she's going to think I finally went off my rocker. And he said, she'll figure it out. Now, I've not yet fully made that into a habit. But each morning I'm making it more and more of a priority to spend time alone with God, whether reading or praying or simply being quiet and sitting in God's presence. Are you spending time with God each day? What are you doing to stay in love with God? A well-known Trappist monk, Thomas Keating, describes prayer in this way. He says, prayer is like having a date with God. I've always thought it funny that a celibate monk thinks about God in terms of dating. (laughs) But Keating goes on to say this, regular periods of prayer let us get acquainted with Christ and God, not unlike the way we might phone someone who has impressed us or attracted us to their goodness. It's the same way in forming a relationship with God. We have to hang out together. My brothers and sisters, are you spending any time just hanging out with God? Are you giving yourself to those habits and practices that keep us connected to God in a way that that your relationship with Him remains rich and meaningful and alive? Now this morning, I've made it as clear and as plain as I possibly can. God loves you personally, intimately, unconditionally. You're cherished by God and you're precious in God's sight. The question that remains is this, do you love God? Do you really love God? And if so, what are you going to do about it? Let us pray. We thank you, gracious God, for the simple fact that you love us so freely and so generously. Help us now to remember that love is a two-way street. And just as you have loved us, you'd like for us to love you in return. As we begin this new week, help us to desire nothing but you and to give ourselves more fully to those practices that draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.